Berkeley 20. Welcome. And on behalf of the ASLE 2021 leadership team, conference organizers, and membership, thank you. Thank you for your presence and for co creating community through our 2021 virtual conference on the theme of emergence, emergency. I'm Laura Barbas Roden, Professor of Modern Languages at Wofford College, and I'm proud to be with Bethany Wigan, the co president of ASLE. For those of you joining ASLE just for this conference or just for this talk, an extra hearty welcome. ASLE is a professional organization that seeks to inspire and promote intellectual work in the environmental humanities and arts. We are so glad for you to join us today and invite you to help further our work by becoming an ASLE member. It's my great pleasure to introduce Briante McCorkle, a phenomenal organizer, activist, and cultivator of change for more just and regenerative communities. Briante's published profile puts it brilliantly. She is a climate revolutionary and dismantler of racism who works for a healthier, more vibrant future for all people and the planet. Briante currently serves as the director of the Georgia Conservation Voters, which works to elect pro-environment candidates and to mobilize residents to hold elected officials accountable for the policies they further or impede with their votes. She is one of the genius organizers behind the mobilizations of Georgians insisting upon public policy that is grounded in a commitment to justice, equity, and flourishing for all. She is carrying this out in a state in which both she and I spent our years as youth, one like many places in the Americas that has been shaped by settler colonial logics, racialized hierarchies, and also by vibrant life-giving legacies of resilience, placemaking, and care. Briante, we are so honored to have you with us and are eager to think with you and work alongside you for change. Ready? Um, I'm Briante McCorkle, and I'm really excited to uh, talk to you all today. Um, I am going to uh, give into the meat of what we do here at Georgia Conservation Voters. But before I do that, I wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about who I am. Um, and so, yeah, and how I got to this work because you have to, you have to have that personal kind of intrinsic passion to get up and do climate justice work every day. And so, um, yeah, I actually, I'm, I'm a military brat, right? So I moved around a lot as a, as a kid. Um, I spent the first half of my life out in the West, I um, was born in Oklahoma, and I spent about seven years in the middle of the Mojave Desert in California. Um, and so, you know, right around 10 years old, uh, my mom got transferred um, here to Warner Robins, Georgia in middle Georgia. Um, and I remember waking up in the car and seeing literally all of these trees. I had never seen so many trees before in my life. I actually, all the trees I had seen up to that point had been basically supported by like sticks and ropes and sprinkler systems, uh, which wasn't very sustainable um, at all. But so getting to Georgia and, and not only seeing the trees, but seeing whole forests full of them, uh, really just a lush sea of green as far as my eyes could, could see was just mind blowing and really made me realize, wow, this is something special. This is something special we need to protect, not just the trees, but just the environment in general and how different it looks in different places. And um, so that really was a seed that was planted in moving to Georgia. And at the same time, I also went from being on this um, military base in this very military bubble. Um, that base was very isolated from surrounding communities. So um, we were really this, this bubble in the desert of a uh, very diverse uh, community, people from all over the world, all different racial ethnic backgrounds. Um, that was my childhood growing up and hearing about people from Hawaii and people from um, East Asian countries and, um, you know, black people, white folks, everybody was on that base and, and working and, and well, we were kids, so we were playing together. Um, and when I got to Georgia, it was our first time off of a military base in a regular community in America. Um, the military base was like a while away and we were just in community. And going to a truly public school for the first time made me realize uh, very quickly that we had racial equity problems in the United States. It was 
uh, where everything was very segregated. There were black kids over here and white kids over here. And it was very, things were very black and white in Georgia at that time. And um, it was a shock for me having spent the first 10 years of my life in a very diverse multicultural environment to come to one that's very largely black and white and learning that there were expectations of my behavior and um, assumptions being made about me and my family based on um, you know, the race that I, that I am uh, perceived as, which is as a black person. Some people think I'm multiracial, but I, I identify um, as black. And so realizing that we had these social justice issues, realizing that the environment was important and something for, to protect, that's, those are the seeds that Georgia planted in me that have grown over the years and have really centered me in my focus um, in my work and what led me here to Georgia conservation voters. Um, I made my way up from Warner Robins, middle Georgia to Atlanta, the big city. Um, you know, grew up hearing stories about Atlanta and particularly the civil rights and, and social justice work that took place in the city. So it was great to come and be a part of this uh, community. I went to school at Georgia State University, uh, which has one of the distinct the distinctions of being one of the most diverse campuses in the United States. Um, so just wildly multicultural population, which really uh, cemented why you know building um, equitable and inclusive space is so important, um, and doing work in a way that's equitable and inclusive is so important. So Georgia State really furthered that um, education for me. I, I studied public policy. And I and I and I want to be clear. I didn't start out studying public policy. I was my plan was to go be a nurse. I was like, I'm gonna be a nurse and stick needles to people, make some money. That would be great. Help folks out one person at a time. Um, and then I took a public a political science class called Global Issues, and we went through lots of issues plaguing humanity on this planet um, at the, at this moment. Um, everything from education issues, women's rights, healthcare access, nuclear war, um, all of these major challenges that are that are facing um, society as we speak. And then we got to the section about climate change. And I remember being really, really irritated because <laughs> I felt like the other solutions, everything is nuanced, everything's in interconnected, but the other challenges didn't have as clear of a solution as climate change did. Carbon uh, is being emitted into the atmosphere, um, tons and tons and tons of carbon, and that has been happening over decades. And there were early warnings from scientists that said, hey, look, this is, this is gonna be a problem, right? When we, when we disrupt the, the chemical balance of our atmosphere, um, that's going to cause uh, climate changes. At the time, it was global warming, but now we're using the term climate change so that people don't just think everything's just going to get hot. What's going to happen is weather's going to get more extreme. And there are things that we can be doing to reduce our carbon emissions and to, um, you know, at the time there was a discussion about preventing climate change. Um, now I think it's really about mitigating it. And so, you know, we've really missed our window of opportunity to stop climate from, from changing. It's already happening. Just, just this morning, I read an article that a uh, lake in the, in, um, in the polar, what, what was formerly polar, the polar ice caps had melted and just released like tons and tons of, you know, billions of tons of water into the ocean. And, um, you know, the more that the sea level rises, the more the temperature warms, the more extreme the storms get, the more extreme the flooding gets, we get increased incidences of disease, reliability about weather patterns, which also impacts how our food, where it grows, all of these things become uncertain. All of these things threaten the livelihood of our communities. And some places are already experiencing this today. And I, and I felt very frustrated because I thought, you know, we, we know that this is a major problem. This is going to impact everyone in such a significant way. We also know that we could be mitigating it by reducing our carbon emissions and being prepared for what's coming by investing in resilience. So why are these things not happening? And it came clear that we had a leadership problem. We have decision makers um, at literally every level of government who have some level of authority over what happens in our future. And so I am going to just go ahead and like 
get into my presentation. So, so I switched majors. I decided to study public policy and it led me through this career of sustainability. I started off working on water issues and then I ended up at a, another nonprofit working on green infrastructure, uh, green building, how we design and build our communities, our cities and our buildings um, and why that's very important from there. I went to go work for Sierra Club, big green organization. Um, and I spent my time working on transit expansion, uh, trying to get cars off the road, um, trying to increase electrification. So electric vehicles that don't have carbon um, emissions. Um, and also part of that is expanding public transit, but public transit only works when we design our communities a particular way. So, you know, all of that was work that I got into. And, um, you know, I decided in 2017 to run for Atlanta City Council. So then I learned navigating this political process beyond just trying to get policy changes, trying to actually get elected officials in place who are willing to be the champions, who are willing to pass the laws that help facilitate these policies. Um, I did not win. I got um, very close, uh, 166 votes short out of 9,000 casts. I ran for Atlanta City Council. Um, so, but I was, I was very young at the time and I was very happy with, with how I um, ultimately performed. And, and from there, um, from the Atlanta City Council, I wanted to keep working on city issues. So I decided to work for eco districts and, you know, did a lot of time traveling back and forth across the country to different communities that were struggling with trying to build these green, sustainable cities of the future. Um, and those green sustainable cities of the future also lead to cost increases, cost of living increases, rent goes up, uh, mortgages go up, property taxes go up, and they also can be catalysts for displacement and exacerbate the affordable housing crisis that's going on in, in cities right now all across this nation, um, especially here in Atlanta. And so um, I wanted to make sure that we, as that green didn't become the enemy that we were thinking comprehensively about our climate solutions so that they also included people who are traditionally left out of these solutions, people who are traditionally left behind, which are uh, African-American people, Latino, Asian folks, lower income folks. Um, and you know, so we have to make sure that we're doing it comprehensively so that the solutions that we are, we are pushing truly impact everyone. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. But after Eco Districts, I, I left that because, not because I didn't care about the mission, but because I wanted to be back in community, organizing people. I spent a lot of time at, in the previous role talking to um, developers and elected officials, um, policymakers, and the key piece that was missing was community, right? Without community, we can't really compel our leaders to do anything, <laughs> really. Um, I think that, you know, community is the most important factor in whether or not we achieve a future that is truly just and sustainable. And so um, I got the opportunity to lead Georgia Conservation Voters. Uh, Georgia Conservation Voters is a state affiliate of the League of Conservation Voters. And it had not been active in the state of Georgia for quite some time. A lot of that had to do with disinvestment in Georgia, in general, people feeling like, oh, it's a conservative red state, we're not going to get any progress on this issue um, that should be nonpartisan, but unfortunately has been pushed into a partisan uh, framework. And um, so there was a lot of, uh, you know, absence of organizing um, in a truly comprehensive way on environment in the state. There were people who were trying. And so GCD came and re was reborn and I've been at the helm and, and, and redesigning it. And we are very much focused on advancing climate justice in Georgia. So I wanna kind of talk a little bit more specifically about climate change and how that's showing up in our state. So if you'll bear with me, we'll get this video up and it's just a short two minute clip. <laughs> Thank you. 
The effects of climate change are becoming more and more evident each year around the world, and Georgia is not excluded from these life-altering events. Here in Georgia, we are most at risk for extreme heat, drought, wildfires, and inland and coastal flooding. But what does this mean for Georgia's growing population, and what will it cost to the state's GDP? Heat itself is one of the leading weather-related killers, and Georgia is at risk for more heat wave deaths in the upcoming years. More heat equals more people getting heat exhaustion. More heat also means higher utility bills. Georgia currently averages about 20 dangerous heat days a year. By 2050, it is projected to see more than 90 such days a year. Summer droughts are projected to get worse. Droughts have a big impact on the production of peanuts, pecans, peaches, and the sweet Vidalia onion, all of which grow in Georgia. The historic 2007 drought cost the Georgia agricultural industry more than $339 million in crop losses. Rising temperatures are also likely to increase the demand for water while also making it less available. The number of large fires on Forest Service land is increasing dramatically. More than 4.6 million people living in Georgia, or 48% of the state's population, are living in areas at elevated risk for wildfire. Georgia currently has 650 square miles that fall within the 100-year coastal floodplain. By 2050, this area is projected to increase to more than 900 square miles due to sea level rise. This combination of heat and water mean the Atlantic hurricane season is seeing more major storms than ever. But how much will this cost? Georgia projects a negative change to the state GDP of nearly $34.2 billion. Georgia is expected to suffer the fifth largest GDP drop from climate change. With all of these changes coming to Georgia, families who rely on farming will be affected by drought. Communities who live on the coast are at risk of being displaced. These are just a few examples of how the people of Georgia, not only its GDP, will be affected by climate change. So as we can see, climate change already has a pretty significant impact in Georgia. Um, and just a couple more facts on how it's showing up. Currently, more than 310,000 Georgians are especially vulnerable to extreme heat. Um, in the last decade, Georgia experienced one wildfire that caused about $2.6 billion in damages and 21 deaths. In the last decade, Georgia also experienced three droughts that caused a total of 52 billion in damages and 218 deaths. Um, in 2019, three counties in Georgia received F grades for their number of days of unhealthy ozone levels and the Atlanta area was ranked 23rd in the nation for annual particulate pollution. Um, a 2017 report showed Georgia's drinking water was among the least safe in the nation due to um, exposure to leaks from things like coal ash ponds, which are uh, coal ash, if you're not familiar, is a byproduct of waste from burning coal for energy. Georgia has the nation's largest coal plant um, in our state. It's actually just north of Macon, Georgia, in a community called Juliet. And just if you're not familiar with Georgia's demographics, Macon, Georgia is about 70% African American. So there, there are um, these coal ash ponds in places like uh, like Macon, but it, uh, in Juliet. Um, but there are also in other parts of the state that are not properly lined and leaking into the groundwater, one of many threats to water in the nation, I mean, in the state. And then we also have lead pipe issues. Uh, lots of testing has been done on leads and particularly lead pipes in schools. And there's been a big focus in recent years to try to clean that up. So Georgia's drinking water is also <clears throat> not in a great place um, from existing environmental pollution, but also um, being threatened by climate change uh, because in, in the past decade, Georgia experienced five hurricanes totaling about 115 billion in damages and 258 deaths. Um, uh, there was a big hurricane that came through in 2018. It just completely, it was right, uh, right before the harvest and just completely wiped out uh, farmer's income for like the entire year. <laughs> and they just, they had to be bailed out. We needed federal assistance to keep families afloat because this hurricane hit and just completely devastated the industry. Um, and that's gonna continue. Um, currently, and I also, also should say about hurricanes in Georgia, um, hurricane season, which runs from about the summer until the early fall, always impacts election season as well. Uh, there was one year, I, I can't remember exactly the year, I wanna say it was 2018 as well, where a hurricane came through and lots of families had to evacuate 
and um, were not able to cast their votes um, because they were fleeing for their lives in terror of the storm. Um, and so that's also a dynamic here. Currently, 100,000 people are at risk of coastal flooding in Georgia, and by 2050, an additional 38,000 people are protected to be at risk of coast, projected to be at risk of coastal flooding, and that's due to the sea level rise. Part of what I alluded to earlier with the polar ice caps melting, sea level is going to rise. Currently, more than 570,000 people are in risk of inland flooding in Georgia, so we think a lot about the coast, but we also need to think about the ways in which our communities have been built and designed, and that often lower income communities and, and communities that are of color are sited in places that are vulnerable to flooding. And if we have extreme heavy downpour with rains, which is a, another uh, manifestation of, of a change in climate, just more extreme weather, more heavy rain events, then we can expect flooding in, even in parts of the state that aren't adjacent to the coast. Um, and so that's, we should be also mindful of that inland flooding, flooding as well. And also that we've had four major flooding events that cost us about 9.2 billion in damages and 102 deaths. And this is just, you know, uh, what we've been able to, to track and trace. Um, and so what's important to note is that these things are already impacting Georgians. Georgians are already feeling it and they believe in climate change and the majority believe in climate change. 66% of Georgians believe in climate change and 58% of the state residents are, are worried about it. So most people are believe in it. Some people are like, well, it's not a big problem, but a lot of people do think it's a problem. And in fact, it's a majority of the state and 59% of Georgians believe that the president and Congress should do more to address climate change and 58% believe that their governor and local officials should do more. So the majority believe that more should be done. Um, and so the question really comes in to what I was talking about earlier, what set me on this path of if we know this problem is here and we know what some of the solutions could be um, or where we should be looking for solutions, which is things that reduce carbon emissions, then, you know, why is it that we keep making decisions, our laws are structured in a way that allows us to keep doing harm to our planet, to the people on it, um, and to keep exacerbating climate change? Why are our leaders not doing more to create policies that guide us in a more positive direction in the future? Um, and there's a couple of answers to that. And I think that, um, you know, that's why our organization exists. But before I get into that, I wanna dive a little bit more into solutions because um, I think that the question of what could be done has been one of the biggest things that have prevented us from moving forward. I think if you go out and you ask the average Georgian or American, hey, you know, do you think climate change is an issue? Do you think it's important? The average person is going to say, yes, I think it's, it's, a, it's an issue. I think it's important. I think something should be done about it. Um, and then you ask, well, what can be done? And then you get answers literally all over the map, <laughs> all over the map. People are like, oh, God, we gotta stop eating meat. We gotta like get clean energy. We gotta, you know, uh, clean up our plastic waste. And so there's all of these different ways in which environment shows up for people. And so even though technically there's a majority there, it, it kind of breaks down when we start talking about specific solutions. Um, and so it's important that we get really clear on the solutions that we want and the solutions that have the most impact here in Georgia and make sure the, the community knows those solutions so that they can advocate for them and, and move them forward. And I think we've taken a major step towards that. Um, one of the things that I find really exciting is uh, this book called Project Drawdown. I don't know if you're you all have heard of Project Drawdown, but Project Drawdown uh, was a comprehensive study about all of these different potential climate solutions. And um, what they did was they took those solutions, they analyzed them to figure out how, if we did them, what was the ultimate amount of carbon reduction? And so, you know, how many emissions are we able to eliminate by implementing each solution? And then from there, they ranked them in order of the solutions that um, would have the greatest impact in reducing carbon emissions, and, as well as um, th those that would have the least. And the book also um, considers other actions that are important um, and for actually um, implementing those solutions as well. So 
I like to do this usually in a crowd. Um, so we're, we're virtual. So it's a little bit of a harder format, but we love uh, testing this because um, in the book project drawdown, there were five solutions for curbing climate change um, that were identified as the top. Um, it, there's a much larger list, but these were the top five. And so managing refrigeration chemicals, cutting down on food waste, restoring tropical forests, eating more plants and less meat. And just to be clear, this is not telling you, you gotta go vegan. This is just saying eat a little bit less meat. Um, and then installing onshore wind turbines. These were the five top solutions identified for reducing carbon emissions. And so when I ask people to rank them, I always get lots of different answers because people are like, wow, like I actually don't know which ones are more effective. And so ranking them, you've got managing refrigeration chemicals that comes up number one. And that one, I got to say, it just shocked me, right? We all have refrigerators. Restaurants have refrigerators. Fr refrigeration is used in transportation. In the medical industry, it's everywhere. Um, and it is pretty significant um, that we could take about 629 million cars off the road if we were better at managing those chemicals. Um, Installing onshore wind turbines is number two. Cutting down on food waste is number three. Um, and eating more plants and less meat is number four. I got to say, these have really stuck with me. Um, I always make a joke that, you know, that's why I'm a little, little chubby because I eat everything <laughs> just because I don't want to waste it. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, eating more plants and less meat is number four. That's also stuck with me. I am mostly vegetarian now. I'm not perfect, but I am mostly vegetarian now. And that's been a journey. Um, and then restoring our tropical forest. So some of these solutions are solutions that are made um, beyond the control of the individual consumer. And some of these are solutions that our industrial industries can make, but either way, government um, policy can help facilitate every single one of these things. Um, and so I'll go ahead and backtrack here for a second and say that this is on a global scale, this, this research was done. Um, and again, the book is called Project Drawdown. There was an initiative that actually took this and um, made it Georgia specific. And that initiative is called Georgia Drawdown. And Georgia Drawdown looked at the, the solutions in this, this book and said, hey, what is specific to Georgia? And what we got out of our study was electricity, transportation, um, food and agriculture, land use, and uh, I, can never, I can't remember the last one. Um, but the, those are the main ones. And so this is emerging research. They just really launched most of it last year. And so, um, you know, our plan is to really take that, the Georgia drawdown and really make sure that all of our elected officials and the public is aware that these are the levers of change in Georgia that will be most effective. But it took a long time, as you can see, we've been talking about climate for decades, to get to this place of clarity about solutions. And then there are still places that are trying to take these solutions and make them state specific so that they can be actionable on the, from the public and elected officials. Um, and so this is one big barrier uh, for people is knowing exactly what the most effective things are in the state to be asking for. As we're moving closer to that, you know, we have to tackle some of these other things that are keeping people from engaging because, as I said, a lot of these decisions can be made individually, but some of these decisions need a little bit uh, or a lot of support um, in terms of our policies and our laws, which are currently designed to uphold the fossil fuel industry, to uphold industries that are not particularly sustainable. Um, you know, we heavily subsidize uh, oil companies, fossil fuel companies at the, at the federal level, those subsidies come down to the state level, the state does it, does it as well. We heavily subsidize um, an unsustainable transportation system. In 2015, Georgia spent, passed a law to spend $10 billion a year, 10, I mean, $10 billion over 10 years. So it's a billion dollars a year. And that $10 billion package, every dime of it went to roads. It went to repaving and constructing new roads. 
there was no investment or very little, it was something like $200 million, which compared to 10 billion is a drop in the bucket that went to public transit. And Georgia has about 159 counties and, and about 120 some odd of them have transit systems, even if they're small systems. So they were in need of a tremendous amount of investment, giving people an alternative way to get around. But instead, all of the investment went into roads, which is crazy. So, so and that's a, that was a decision, right? That was a policy decision that was made recently, as recently as 2015. So you can see that there's a huge disconnect in between this major problem that the majority of public of the public and Georgians are concerned about and want action on, and these things that our decision makers continue to do. And part of it was a lack of clarity. And the other part of it now is um, making sure that now these solutions are out, that people are empowered to talk to their elected officials and hold them accountable to delivering on this issue. Um, so we ask, we think a lot pretty heavily about what keeps people from engaging um, here at Georgia Conservation Voters um, because it informs our work. We know that um, politics can make people uncomfortable. They feel like there's a lack of civility and hostility. I mean, we're talking about very, very personal issues here um, that impact everybody's lives. Um, the other issue is lack of information about the issues. So I talked a little bit about <laughs> you know, getting to a place of clarity on that. We're not all the way there yet, but we're getting there. Um, but there's still a lack of info about candidates um, or even processes to engage with our elected officials or to support candidates that you do like. Um, and so loss of trust due to few role models or positive examples. Um, you know, the media is constantly berating when bad things are happening and bad decisions are happening and does not do a great job lifting up the amazing things that are happening in the climate space, uh, especially here in the state of Georgia. So not seeing those examples, those transformative stories, you know, really takes a lot of momentum and hope away from people. There's a lack of how to. People want to engage. It's just how do you find this information out? How do you talk to people? How do you vote? There's so many questions about how to be an active citizen in shaping policy in America, um, which is, I say, a great shortcoming of um, our government uh, sort of abdicating its responsibility to make sure that citizens understand their government and how to work within it. It's a democracy, it should be a priority. But that's why groups like mine exist. Lack of facts and rampant misinformation is also an issue. And that's an issue that really emerged. It's been a problem, but has really emerged to the forefront in um, the last uh, couple of election cycles. So GCV thinks about this because all these things inform um, the way that we decided to structure our work. So um, our vision for the Georgia Conservation Voters Education Fund is a future where people are, Georgia's people are fully engaged in building a just, inclusive, sustainable, and resilient state. So um, we wanna make sure that people are fully engaged. That means tackling some of these obstacles that we've talked about for people engaging. Uh, the mission of the Georgia Conservation Voters Education Fund is to mobilize Georgians to advance climate and environmental justice through education, advocacy, and other forms of civic engagement. So we have a vision of Georgians being very involved in shaping this just and sustainable future. And our mission is to make sure that we're doing what we can to mobilize Georgians with that education, with the advocacy, and making sure that they're civically involved. So that is one of our organizations. We also have a sister organization that's just called Georgia Conservation Voters. And it, it, the mission and vision are very similar. Our vision for GCV is a future where the political landscape has changed to place a high priority on building a just, inclusive, sustainable, and resilient Georgia. Right now, our elected officials politically are not focused on building a just, sustainable, and inclusive future. They're focused on attacking each other and being petty and getting back and forth and keeping power and all of these things that are not solving the issue that I would say is probably the core American issue. We want to be living in communities where we can thrive, communities that are just, communities that are sustainable and resilient. We want to live this life that is uh, healthy, that is connected, and our elected officials just are not making that a priority right now. 
And so, you know, they're cutting taxes and everything else. And their, their priority is sustaining GDP, but dollars won't help us if food is not growing. And so our mission is to advocate for public policies that advance a more just and sustainable future. We campaign for candidates who will make climate and environmental justice a priority, and we hold elected officials accountable for their actions and votes. So whereas our education fund is focused on educating the public and mobilizing the public, our Georgia conservation voters is focused on really advancing and moving forward policies, keeping elected officials accountable to what they're doing and not doing on these issues. And the reason why, and I should also say we have an action fund, the Georgia Conservation um, Voters Action Fund, which is a political action committee. And the reason why we have these three organizations is because they work together to create a cycle of accountability that's been broken in Georgia, especially when it comes to the environmental movement. Um, that cycle of accountability first starts with a clear vision for a sustainable future. What, do, what does that future look like in Georgia? What are the policies that get us there? So, you know, talk about some of that work um, and we still have to make sure that it gets communicated to the public and the public understands that these are solutions and also the public is able to help shape these solutions because without public input, the solutions will ultimately not be reflective of what is actually truly needed and what's actually truly going on in communities. So we have to make sure that we're engaging the public and just constantly clarifying and refining these policies. So we have a clear vision on the future that we want in our state and the policies that get us there. We do grassroots training and mobilizing. We have to make sure that we're building leaders in communities because this is such a big topic. Um, GCV could have a hundred staff people and not be able to solve or deal with every environmental issue in the state. Ultimately, we have to empower a community to have the skills and the ability and the know-how to navigate their uh, local governments, to, to, to navigate the processes they need to get the changes they wanna see in their community. Um, <clears throat> advancing legislation. We do that work to advance legislation to, uh, because we've gotta be in the Capitol. And I'll talk a little bit more about it, but I say the Georgia State legislative session is one of the most dangerous times of the year for Georgians because they're there and they're making policies, hundreds of bills, hundreds of bills introduced every session that have a huge impact on people's lives in this state and on the environment. Um, and so we have to be there when they're negotiating it um, because it's a, it's, it's a hard process to follow and the average person isn't like, you know what, I just had a long day at work. Let me check out the, door, the legislative page and see what bills got introduced. People aren't doing that. So we have to be there to make sure that people know, hey, look, this terrible thing is moving forward and, and this is your opportunity to, uh, to influence that and to talk to legislators uh, so that we have somebody there countering the message that these lobbyists are giving them. And the lobbyists are typically moneyed interests coming from industries that are doing the polluting, that are feeding misinformation to legislators. Oh, the coal plants aren't that bad. Oh, you know, people aren't really, you know, that information um, gets to legislators and they act on it. And so a lot of it isn't malicious. A lot of it's really just ignorant. So we have to be there in the in the session during session crafting policies and then when it's done we do a scorecard um, and this the the scorecard is basically hey look these are the bills that came up that were most important to environment and here's how your legislators decided to vote on them so it gives people a clear measure of whether or not their legislator is acting in their interest on this issue or not and then that takes us to the next level which is activating environmental voters we use our scorecard and questionnaires to decide whether which candidates are going to be the strongest champions for this issue and we endorse them and support them in winning and we also help people get out to vote and just navigating voting in georgia which has gotten well it was always a little complicated but it's gotten even more complicated given the recent events so the blue is our education fund and that's a big undertaking alone and the green is where our gcv and our political action committee really pick up but it allows us to be engaged full cycle every step of the way of the policy making process from how it's shaped to how um, you know how, how it actually comes together during the legislative session 
to who's actually even in these seats, who, who, who's able to move these things forward and shape them um, in their capacity as elected officials. So that is what our organizations um, work together to do. And so there's different programming for each. The Georgia Conservation Voters Education Fund focuses on democracy for all, on clean energy for all and environmental justice. And so I'm gonna get into that in a minute. Um, Georgia Conservation Voters, it focuses on lobbying and producing the scorecard. And then our Georgia Conservation Voters Action Fund, uh, which is our political action committee, it focuses on endorsements and actually getting involved in electoral campaigns. And so no matter which program we're talking about, we center environmental justice. It is so critical that we talk about environmental justice in Georgia, but also everywhere else. Without it, our solutions are incomplete. Without it, our movement is incomplete because communities of color are on the front lines of existing environmental pollution. As the climate changes and we experience the drought, the heat, the increase in incidences of disease, the flooding, it is communities of color and lower income communities who will experience those impacts first. Um, and as I said earlier, many of them already are experiencing those impacts. Um, the other thing is that, with, as I said, it, it, it really lessens our power when we don't talk about things in an intersectional way. And, I, and I'm going to pick a little bit on the early conservation movement. Um, the early conservation movement focused on protecting natural spaces. Let's protect the trees. Let's protect the water. Let's, um, let's do this work to you know, conserve these areas and these natural spaces. And while I got to say I value that because you know, I'm glad that some of these places in America were protected and are still pristine. I enjoy going to national parks. I love all of that. I love seeing wildlife and, and, and um, you know, the flora and the fauna in different parts of the state. And I'm glad that there was a huge conservation movement for many years to protect it. But the biggest threat to the species in these areas that we're trying to protect is no longer human development or encroachment. It is climate change. It is absolutely climate change. And if you're going to solve climate change issues, you have to think about them comprehensively. Uh, you have to think about the intersection because these are intersectional issues. If you're talking about changing where we get our electricity from, uh, putting solar in communities, putting solar on homes, you have to ask the question of who's gonna be able to even afford that, that solar? Is it, is it affordable, is it accessible? Because if the only people that can benefit from the solution are wealthy people who are already the most insulated from climate change and the impacts of it, are you really solving the problem? Not really, you're just pushing it around. You're just pushing it around. And I kind of talk about this a lot with the way that we've cited toxic activity, industrial activity. It's typically gone into these lower income communities of color. And they've done that intentionally. And that has allowed you know, these problems to get so bad. In the 1970s, you had communities coming together saying, no, we're gonna fight this coal plant. We don't want it in our community. And they won their battle, but guess what? The other community didn't win the battle. The, the, got, the plant got built and it got built in their neighborhood. And so the original group of environmental activists, which at the time was mostly white, mostly wealthy, um, they felt, hey, look, we got a victory. There was no coal plant in my community. My air is clean, this is great. But the communities of color were sitting there living with that pollution, getting physically ill from it. Meanwhile, all those carbon emissions kept coming out and they kept going into the atmosphere and they kept worsening climate change. So imagine if the fight had been at the time, not just let me move this power plant out of my community, but let's not build it in anyone's community. How much differently we would have gotten things done. So the continual sort of pushing things into communities of color and act out of sight, out of mind has been a big major problem that has led to communities being on the front lines, having health impacts, um, but also letting this climate change problem go on and on and on. And if you want people to get excited, if you wanna see the change, we have to have a mass movement. And so you've gotta talk about the ways in which it's showing up in communities of color and how they're gonna access and also be beneficiaries 
of the changes that we're trying to make, um, that's how you're gonna get your majority. That's how you're gonna get your solutions that are truly comprehensive. Um, so communities that are most impacted are by environmental um, injustices are also really just strong supporters of action on climate change because they have been experiencing the health impacts, but they're underrepresented in the environmental movement because of the sort of lack of sensitivity on how these policies are shaped up and accessible. Um, and then the other part that's really frustrating about this is that these same communities of color who um, consistently poll that this issue is important and needs to be addressed very highly, higher than any other um, racial um, group, uh, communities of color, they poll higher on this topic in support of it. But they're also underrepresented at the polls due to rampant voter suppression, which I'll have a little time to get into later. And so um, I kind of talked through all three of these things simultaneously, but hopefully it's clear that environmental justice has to be front and center and all of the work that we do, we have to constantly be thinking about, does the solution work for those that have the least of things? Does the solution work for those who are most impacted? And if we think that way, we can get brought bigger support, we can build greater power, we can tackle these issues comprehensively and really win. And I just kind of want to drive home the emphasis of environmental justice with COVID. Um, as I said earlier, increased disease incidence of disease is uh, something that we can expect with climate change. COVID is not the first pandemic. Um, it's not going to be the last either. Um, and so when you think about the way that COVID actually impacted people in real time, there were an abundance of articles that showed up that said the black community had been harmed the absolute most Hispanic community right above that. And the white community was least impacted. Um, not that they weren't impacted at all, but as a percentage, as incidents, yeah, it was communities of color that, that bore the brunt. And um, what we found was that those communities of color were also areas that were, that had higher levels of air pollution. Um, and so if your community, if you were living in a community with higher levels of air pollution, you are also more likely to uh, contract COVID and die from it. So these are all very, very, very connected issues and it really manifested with the COVID crisis that we were all continuing to live through. And I specifically call out Albany, Georgia because they, we had been dealing with, uh, they were one of the worst hit in the state of Georgia. It's a mostly African-American community, over 70%. Um, you know, we'd been engaged there talking about high power bills for some time. We were also engaged there fighting a natural gas compressor plant that had opened up in the community. Um, so of course, lots of air pollution. Um, and so, yeah, it just sort of just all came to a head in this African American community um, during COVID. So environmental justice and thinking about things from this lens is really important to make sure that we're delivering the solutions to where they really need to be. And so I kind of already talked about the burden of pollution and, and where that communities of color are experiencing it. So let me get into the, the meat of our programs. And I, and I know we're, we're, I've been talking for a long time, so um, I will uh, try to be more concise with these. So the Democracy for All is um, our education fund work. All of these are done under our education fund. Um, and so Democracy for All is really about our electoral process. It's about supporting efforts to protect voting rights and making it easier for all people to participate we also have Clean Energy for All, which is focused on holding Georgia Power, our electric membership co-ops and municipal utilities accountable to expanding renewable energy and energy efficiency portfolios. It's also about preserving, um, preventing them from raising rates on people um, unnecessarily so that the power companies can profit while people pick up the burden. And then environmental justice. So we, we are invested in organizing with communities of color to train and mobilize people um, to lead the fight because we need a whole army of, of people, a whole squad of people um, in all the nooks and crannies um, to address this problem at the scale that it needs. So let me dig into democracy for all. You should vote, you should vote. If you're not a voter, you, sh you, should, you should vote. It's, it's one of the bare minimum things <laughs> about being in a democracy um, is your ability to exercise your right to vote. 
Um, what we found is that environmentalists don't turn out that well. Um, and that's because a lot of people who are ranking environment and climate as highly important, um, people of color, young people, et cetera, are also the people who have greatest challenges getting to the polls and exercising their votes. Um, so this, is, this is, becomes a problem when we get to policymaking and decision-making because elected officials ultimately are motivated by being reelected, which is really unfortunate. I, I think there are very few who are in there because they wanna make a change and that's their highest priority. And if they lose their seat in the process of fighting for a community, then they feel proud. Very few are in office that have that mindset. Many of them are like, hey, look, I just wanna get reelected. This is a cushy position for me. Very unfortunate, but they are driven by elections. And so voting does matter. Um, and so we wanna make sure that people get out and that they're holding their elected officials accountable when they're doing terrible things on environment. And a lot of times that's not what drives voters to the polls. They're being driven to the polls because of other issues, typically things like um, you know, LGBTQ rights or abortion. Or those are things tend to be top of mind, economics, jobs. Um, but when you ask people, it, it, we did a poll in Georgia last year, you know, we had a very competitive election cycle. So we did a poll in some of the most competitive areas. And what we found was that, you know, the issues that drove people to the polls were jobs, economy and health because of co course COVID was top of mind. Um, and at the very, very bottom of the ticket were environment and climate. They, they were literally the last two, the dead last is two issues driving people to the poll, which is ironic considering that environment and climate and the decisions made on those impact the economy, public health and jobs. So top of the ticket items that people are concerned about, this issue is all over it. So we, we gotta make sure that as environmentalists, we get out and we keep the environment in mind when we go to the polls and we, we don't let other issues overshadow this longer term issue um, that we're all trying to solve and that we're holding our elected officials accountable to it um, when we hit the polls. Some of our democracy and work in 2020 looked like getting involved in the census. The census, super, super important. It only happens once a decade, um, but basically we're trying to get a count um, and a demographic breakdown, just trying to really understand what population looks like in different parts of the state. Um, Georgia hasn't had a stellar participation rate and it's unfortunate because if you don't do the census properly, and you don't, you don't get a good, good count, you could miss out on vital resources for your community in every area, but also an environment. Um, so voter registration, um, we uh, work to help uh, as a part of a coalition to help register voters. There are of course some rock stars in our state with voter registration. Um, so we were one of many other organizations that weren't in the limelight, but were diligently registering voters, um, even if it was just a handful of them at a time. Every, every new reg registration counted. Um, and then voter turnout, because it's not enough to get people registered to vote. You also need to make sure they make it to the polls. And that's really important. Um, diving into voter suppression in a little bit, um, in December 2019, 300,000 voters were purged from the rolls by the Georgia Secretary of State. That's 4% of the electorate. And I want to be really clear that this has gone on. There was a recent purge just a month ago here in the state. Um, now, the state maintains that these purges are to keep the integrity of the list. And, and, and I think that that sounds great. It sounds great if it were true. There are many people who get targeted by these purges, um, uh, who were per whose registrations were perfectly fine. Um, people get purged. They're like, I don't, I haven't moved, nothing happened, but I got eliminated. So it's really important that we remind people to check um, the registration periodically so that they don't get caught up in these purges um, that have, at the end of the day, you know, cause voters to show up at the polls and not be on the rolls and not be able to cast their votes. Um, and so other types of suppression in our state include exact match laws. So if you do a voter registration, you know, your whatever is on the voter registration paperwork has to match exactly your identification paperwork, which I've got an interesting name. My name is Briante Laeva McCorkle. There's an accent on my E. My middle name is La Ava. It's actually two separate words, but it's often written as one word. These little mistakes could cause somebody's voter registration to be rejected. 
And so that mostly impacts people of color who tend to have you know, non-traditional names with spacing and hyphens and accents. And so um, that really, uh, it's been proven to, to impact people of color. And that practice continues to go on in our state. Uh, precinct closures, uh, they do that all the time. They do, they justify the precinct closures any number of ways, but at the end of the day, there are less precincts. It's typically in communities of color and it's typically in heavily populated democratic areas in our state, like the city of Atlanta, where these precincts just get closed for different reasons. Um, inadequate machines, we have we've had this whole debate in Georgia about the machines and the security of the machines. And there was even a situation where there was a precinct that didn't have enough machines. There, the machines were like left in a warehouse somewhere. So like the technology and the security of the technology, um, it has been heavily scrutinized in our state, especially in the runoff, the fallout from the election, um, as we saw you know, several audits um, of votes of ballots um, which also had a lot to do with the increase in absentee ballot voting that was necessary um, for people to cast their vote safely in the middle of the pandemic. People felt like they did not, were not going to be safe going to the polls. Um, and it should be a good thing that we have a way for people, to, many different ways for people to cast their votes. Um, but if it's now become a political target um, and the, the ballots are being scrutinized pretty heavily, um, ballots are being rejected. Uh, there, for different reasons, there, I, there was an article that showed some exact reasons why, uh, some clear examples of, of uh, ballots that have been rejected. And, and one of them, for example, a gentleman circled, uh, circled in the name of the candidate they wanted, and then also wrote in their name on the write-in line. So just, you know, to be extra clear, I want this candidate. But the vote, the ballot was invalidated because they said he tried to vote twice as if someone couldn't understand that he, it, it was very clear which candidates he wanted. So, so absentee ballots um, and in making sure that they're not getting rejected, that they're being filled out properly, all of that, um, not, they're not being a lot of information or clarity about that, those laws changing. Um, we just had a big legislative session, Senate Bill 202 passed and Senate Bill 202 basically changed uh, laws around absentee ballot voting in our state um, shortening the window to request it, shortening the window to return it. Um, and so we have to make sure that we are out and communicating about those changes and also communicating to people how to clearly mark their ballots so they don't, their votes don't get invalidated for petty reasons. Um, so, um, and then I'll say this one more. I talked about the census. The census is particularly important because it impacts redistricting. Um, and uh, what we know is that the majority of Georgians care about environment and climate. And actually, if, if you ask them not about climate change, but about expanding renewable energy and clean energy, we get numbers as high as 70 plus percent of Georgians, regardless of race or party back, background, that support expansion of renewable energy and clean energy in the state. If that's the case, why are our leaders not acting on this? There are plenty of clean energy bills that get introduced um, in the last legislative session, we had a 100% clean energy bill that got introduced. That bill didn't go anywhere. And it's primarily because right now, Republicans have a super majority in the state, meaning they, they have most of the positions, um, elected positions throughout the state. And because they have a majority in both the, the Senate and the representatives chambers, they, they control all of the committees. Every bill that gets introduced in Georgia has to go to a committee. And so whoever's in charge of the committee can decide what bills get debated, what bills get voted on, what bills get moved forward. So we have a very effective block of Republicans in charge of nearly every major environment, well, every major environmental committee or committee that would impact environment that just block good legislation from going through. Now, why are they able to maintain that supermajority? Because of gerrymandering. They drew the maps in a way that they had reliably Republican districts and they had a reliable majority. Um, that decimated the competitiveness of elections. It allowed incumbents to just sit in office and not do anything for years and years and years because you know, if a Republican's are already in office, another Republican is unlikely to challenge them, right? So we ended up with, you know, we have this map that says that the majority of Georgians are Republican and um, that is very clear, clearly due to gerrymandering. 
um, you can look at the maps in our state, you can look at the maps in your state, and you can see how these lines are often just drawn into these ridiculous shapes and long strips, etc. To just cut out parts of the population so that they could get their reliable uncompetitive district so they can avoid debate, they can avoid competition, and they can just do what they want. And so it's a big issue. There, there, there's a redistricting committee going on right now. Um, and so we're making sure that everything that they're doing is um, being heavily televised and that the public is being heard in this process. Um, because we can't allow them to continue to draw these maps and draw majorities onto these maps, which effectively deny representation and prevent um, legislators from having to deal, deliver on the issues that Georgians really do want. So um, I'm gonna slip this, skip the side, except to say that, you know, the education fund spends a lot of time making sure people understand all of these different dynamics because we have, so many decision makers, your federal level, your state, your county, your city. Um, the average person in Georgia has about 30 people representing them that are elected. And a lot of people like, I don't know who any of these folks are. You know, uh, people, you, if you ask people who the governor of Georgia is, a lot more people know now because of what's been going on in our state and the visibility that the 2018 governor's race gave to that position. But prior to that, a lot of people couldn't tell you that our governor was uh, Governor Kemp. Um, a lot of people couldn't can't tell you now who their legis state legislators are, who their state senator is or state representative is. They can't tell you what county they live in, what city they live in, let alone who the representatives are. Um, it's it's a major issue in our democracy that Americans don't understand these things. Um, so we spend a lot of time in our Democracy for All program doing this type of education, being there uh, to really fight the census and redistricting or to really fight um, attempts to gerrymander and to suppress the votes. So let me move into clean energy for all. Um, you know, this is one of my most, I love doing this work because clean energy is a major lever in our state. As I said, the Georgia drawdown identified electricity. Electrification is a major opportunity for carbon emissions. So we should be doing more to get solar and wind renewable energy in our state. Um, and the people who make that those decisions um, are primarily the power companies. They're the ones who are building the capacity uh, to generate energy and delivering it to consumers. In our state, um, our power utility is, uh, it is monopoly, meaning everybody is paying this company in some way, even if you have a different name on the top of your power bill uh, because you pay a, a municipal utility or an electric membership co-op. Either way, the municipal utility and the electric membership co-op are buying power wholesale from Georgia Power. Georgia Power is the company that has a monopoly in our state. And if you're familiar, they're a subsidiary of Southern Company. And Southern Company is, is doing really extremely well. And I mean, just billions of dollars in profit, the executives are getting paid the multi-million dollar compensation bonuses, et cetera. Um, but where's all that? Where's all that profit coming from? It's coming from you. It's coming from me. It's coming from people paying bills in Georgia who are, as we've just talked about, living through a pandemic, still recovering, struggling in general. And they're part of the struggles to keep up with these increasing power bill rates. Um, so the Georgia power is a monopoly. And because they're a monopoly, the state had enough foresight to create a panel of five elected officials, public service commissioners, whose job it is is to maintain the service and reliability of our power and to make sure that it is affordable and that consumers are not being taken advantage of because there is a monopoly in the state and they don't have any competition. So our public service commission has really failed on the second part of their job, which is defending people from the greed of the power company um, and so in that process, they've sort of given the company everything they wanted, including very low targets on renewable energy, energy efficiency. I mean, they do nominal things, a couple megawatts there and here, but we are really missing the boat on the opportunity here in Georgia and the Public Service Commission could be pushing to do more there. Um, and in addition to sort of telling Georgia Power, you know, setting these targets for the power company, they also have a direct 
um, influence on rates. So right after they say, hey, look, this is the power that we want you to invest in. This is how many solar megawatts energy efficiency we think you should do, um, which again is very minimal. Um, they also follow that process up and decide how much people are gonna pay for it. So um, they consistently and over the past several decades have raised power bills. And it's not just all bills, it's residential bills. So it's individual people paying bills. And that's where every increase is going on to the individual person. And so a lot of people don't know this commission exists. A lot of people don't know that these folks represent them um, and that they're they're elected and that they have this type of influence over what is basically a kitchen, a truly kitchen table issue. Your power bill hits that kitchen table, right? Um, and so uh, some of the decisions that they've made have been um, allowing a nuclear plant that is now billions of dollars over budget. And I'm, I'm saying billions with a B, billions of dollars over budget. This is one of the most expensive things ever built, like ever. <laughs> like it is billions of dollars over budget. It's way behind schedule. And the, the cost for constructing it continue to be passed on to consumers. Um, this fall, they're having another round of hearing to pass on another about $525 million in costs to the customer. Um, and, and typically the Public Service Commission just would approve that and people's power bills would go up. And I just wanna say really clearly about nuclear, we're not trying to get the nuclear plant shut down. At this point, we are so far gone on these, these nuclear plants that you know you might as well finish them up. But the thing is that we don't want people to be charged for them. We don't want people to be charged because the company is actually making a profit on this. So rather than putting the cost onto everyday people, the company should eat the cost of its bad decision making. And that's important because the company also had the opportunity to invest in more solar and more wind. And these are less expensive, less costly to build, and they don't produce as much harmful pollution. Um, the power company insists that nuclear energy is clean, it's it's you know, it's emissions free, but emissions free does not does not mean harm free. Uh, nuclear activity still produces nuclear waste, which is still not safe, which is still not being dealt with in a great way. It's radioactive. It's messing with things on a very subatomic level. It's been proven to be leaking chemicals into the groundwater of the community surrounding it, which is Burke County. The women there are having reproductive health issues. They cannot um, have children because the chemical, the, it's a very specific chemical tritium is in their water as a result of all the nuclear activity in their county, part of which is these plants. Um, so this is not an, a harm-free form of energy. And um, it's also very expensive. And if the company is the people that push to get it built, they should be the people picking up the tab. Maybe they'll learn a lesson about uh, which forms of energy they should invest in in the future. But right now they'll never learn that lesson as long as customers are picking up the tab. Plant vocals, part, part of it, they, they passed on COVID-19 costs. The company incurred like millions of dollars in cleaning costs and overtime to keep the power on in the pandemic. And they basically charged everybody for it. They're like, oh, look, we needed to pay more for more cleaning and we had to have some people over time. So you're gonna pick up the tab. But why, when we already pay for the product? It's uh, just the company's cost of doing business. And one of many decisions the Public Service Commission has made against people and in favor of the company. Um, and in 2019, they right in the middle of the holiday season in December, they decided to raise everybody's rates. So people's bills are going to go up um, every three years for the next, uh, every year. So 2019, 2020, and 2021 increases have gone in to effect. So these are just many decisions that the Public Service Commission is making that are both climate decisions as well as uh, environmental justice decisions. So I think that's really important. So I'll just talk about this. Uh, we have a lawsuit right now about the Public Service Commission. There are five uh, elected positions. They are elected statewide, meaning everybody in the state votes for them. However, each of them represents a specific district in the state. So if you wanna do any type of advocacy, you need to talk, they'll tell you, you have to talk to your district representative. But my district representative doesn't have to keep me happy. They can keep people in other parts of the state happy because as long as they can get their votes from outside of my district and win their race, 
they don't have to keep me or anybody else in my district happy. And that's sort of what's happening in Atlanta. Atlanta does not elect Republicans. They typically elect Democrats. The Public Service Commission district seat for this area has been Republican since the commission started. How is that possible? How is that truly representing the people of Atlanta when we know that they don't elect Republicans? It's because that commissioner gets his votes from rural parts of the state, which are more conservative. So he does not have to do anything that black people in Atlanta are asking him to do. Like, hey, look, don't raise the power bills on us, right? So we have a lawsuit, it's a section two voting rights lawsuit. And this is where our democracy for all work and our energy work intersect. That lawsuit is basically challenging the election uh, structure and that it basically denies black communities representation because this structure prevents them from truly electing the representative for their district. Um, and I'll say this, we had that historic runoff in Georgia, the two Senate races that happened in uh, January this year that, that was nationally and internationally publicized. What people didn't know was that there was a third race on that ballot for a public service commissioner. That race also went into a runoff. So they were all on the same ballot, the senators, the commissioners. And what happened was we knew that people were not gonna know this public service commission. They were gonna hear about the Senate races over and over again, and then show up to the polls and not know what this public service commission thing was. So we did all the work, we texted, we called, we, we tried to canvas, we sent mail. This is an example of a mailer that we had sent out um, and trying to make sure that people check all the boxes in this race. And um, we, while we did get a good turnout, we failed at getting our public service commission elected, but we were able to elect two senators and get a democratic president over the whole. So this shows that this race is truly confusing. It's truly obscure, but, in, in, but for groups like mine, a lot of these races would continue to be obscure um, when they have such a big impact over people's day-to-day -day experience. This public service commission race is much more influential in terms of the money coming out of people's pocketbooks every day than the two senators that we got elected. So not that I'm not happy about the senators, but this illustrates why we have to continue to do this long-term work so that we're not trying to just do it during a crowded election cycle, that people really understand truly what these positions are and the influence they have over their lives. So our C4 does legislative scorecard electoral work. This is an example of what our scorecard looks like. If you wanna go on our website and peruse it, um, it also helps people. There's a link to help people figure out what district they live in. And um, we also do endorsements. This is what our endorsements look like. We do our endorsements state level down. Um, and so the, the federal endorsements actually come from our state, our national affiliate League of Conservation Voters, but we do communicate about those. So again, I'm really happy Warnock and Ossoff did win, but I wish that we could have gotten that public service commission race over the, over the hill as well. Um, but that's, that's the work that we do. And so, yeah. I just want you all to stay in touch. You can text GCV to 52886 um, and uh, you know visit us online or follow us on social. Uh, we do a lot of compelling work. Um, we dig into issues and um, yeah, uh, I talk about energy a lot, but lots of things come up and, and we try to be there for community and all of them.